Hey, everybody. We're back. Uh, you may see some stuff behind us that looks like what's going to be the actual worky parts of the shop. Uh, we've finally gotten those done because after four months, we have convinced our neighbor to stop driving his forklift through the wall. I'm not even kidding. Four months. Four months. Forklift of that. through the wall. Forklift pokey through it's wall. It's like living next to the Kool Aid Man. It's not really as cool as you think it is. We've got some clients who would uh, who would be willing to let us show our builds on camera, which is kind of cool. So we are in the process. We're going to show you. We're going to start one today. And we have another couple in the works that we will show you as we go. Today we're working on uh, a build for a, a Houdini themed game. This is for a company called Fifth Wall Escape Rooms in Detroit. And uh, they've got some, their, their concepts are incredibly immersive and we are very excited to be doing this right now. Because of the time period that this game is based in, uh, our pieces will tend towards Art Deco, which is something that we haven't been able to show you in the past, but we're going to be able to do that now. And uh, we'll start with a frame and here's how this looks. Uh, we are now starting to frame up the, uh, the, the cabinet that we're calling the Triple Threat, which is going to have three puzzles crammed very elegantly into one magnificent unit. Um, we are doing this very unlike you might see, uh, I don't know, Ikea furniture, where you have those little cam lock things that, those are fine if you're treating something very delicately, but this is for the public, and as we know, they are monsters. So every face of this is individually framed, skinned with half inch or thicker in some places MDF, so this thing is going to be burly. Um, this is, these are parts of the bottom of the cabinet, and I'm about to start attaching the, uh, the side panel into this. We have fresh off of the CNC machine. This is our bottom panel that we cut a little bit big, so we still have some routing room on the outside of that, just in case all of our assembled pieces, once you have a bunch of pieces coming together as one, you're going to lose the exact mathematical perfection of exactly 40 inches. So we cut this guy to 40 and a quarter, so we'll have an eighth on the side that we can uh, route off so he'll be the full size of the cabinet, even if the cabinet is not exactly the right size. All right, so what we've done, it's, sorry it's noisy in here, what we've done is uh, we've sanded this guy down with 220, dressed all of our seams, uh, filled everything, and then re-sanded it again with 220. Um, that is not what I would consider a fine polished sandpaper. Most people think 220 is fine, it's not. Uh, 1500 is fine for us. Um, but, uh, but giving a fine sanding to the edge of MDF helps to seal up the pores. And what we'll do is I'm going to give it a base coat, sand the whole thing back out again with a minimum of 320, probably 600. Uh, and that'll polish this thing in paint, and then we'll recoat it at least once and sand between each coat. A bit of this, uh, this lip right here will actually be exposed. Uh, and all around this is actually beveled at a 45 degrees, uh, a 45 degree angle. It's called a chamfer bit or chamfering. And what it does is it dresses and softens an edge and makes it a little bit more friendly and, and warm and inviting and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it also adds a bit of, it makes it appear more polished. Uh, the other reason for that is that what we're looking at is the lower cabinet. This is basically just the stand that the rest of it will sit on. And if we tried to make a lower unit and an upper unit, and what we did was we just plopped one box on top of another and there was just sort of a gap well, that looks like crap, but by, by dressing it either with a trim or doing a chamfered edge, that makes it intentional and a dressed portion that is made to be looked at. It's not trying to hide itself. It's not trying to hide the fact that it's a lower unit and an upper unit. It makes it intentional, purposeful, makes the whole thing uh, work better. Here's a cool opportunity for me to tell you some stuff. Uh, what we're looking at right here are the sides, uh, bottom, I'm sorry, top and bottom of the upper unit. So it's going to be a box. Now there's, 
It's a cabinet and there's stuff inside the box. We have a crystal ball with a hologram inside and a, uh, and a cubic uh, orientation puzzle. That's pretty cool, you'll see that. Um, anyway, so people are gonna have to interact with the inside of this box. And uh, we haven't showed you this before, but if we have to do an interior space, especially if it's tight and has a back and all that kind of stuff, it's really difficult to do a paint job inside there and make it look good. You've kind of painted yourself into a corner at that place. It's really difficult to paint inside a box, especially with a sprayer. We use sprayers because the finish quality is so much better. It's, it kind of goes back to the uh, finishing something with a uh, stain and a clear coat. It looks, like you'd, it looks like a homeowner did it as opposed to a professional piece of furniture. Uh, the same case is here. Um, we either use an HPLV, a high pressure, low volume spray gun, or in this case, we're using acrylics and, a, uh, and an airless sprayer. Um, it sounds like something's breaking over there. Um, and uh, also you'll notice that these are built up dimensional solids with full framing. Again, that makes all this stuff incredibly stiff and resilient. This is not your average cabinet. This is a, uh, a bulletproof doohickey thing. What we'll do is we're gonna spray these guys out. It's gonna be spray, sand, spray, sand, at least two coats. And then once they get assembled into a box, they will be, uh, they'll, they'll probably get one light coat on the inside to just marry everything together. So call that the marriage coat. So I'm gonna show you how crazy we get. This is 400 grit sandpaper. This is relatively aggressive for us. Uh, I'm sanding between coats. Now, if I were to sand this, how most normal people would sand this, I would create a problem for myself. That problem is, is that as you sand back and forth, you create dust of the, the, the fibers that I'm shaving off the surface and also the, the high points of the particulate of, the, of the, uh, the, the paint surface itself. That dust sits there and I, I sit there and abrade braid it and it starts to gum up and turn into tiny little balls that you can't even notice until they glue themselves back to the surface. At that point, you've ruined it. Most people don't sand between coats, but if you want to do it well, that's what you have to do. So here's the technique. It's actually sort of like dusting crumbs off a tablecloth. Um, <clears throat> I basically pull the, pull the piece towards me, light pressure, and I am, I'm basically sweeping the piece off to try and evacuate all that stuff. And I'll also, I'll also dust it off on my shirt, and I do that on my black shirt because I can see it. And, um, and that's it. We just do that in several different directions, and it is smooth as glass. Hey guys, my name's Anna. I work here at Grat Sets, and today we're going to be doing some resin pouring type stuff. Um, this is for the Houdini build that we're working on right now, and we are making some little plinths, little platforms for the idols for the puzzle to actually sit on. So to start this off, we have a mold here that we made earlier. I'm going to do some pouring in the mold. I'm going to start with a little bit of detailing since this is art deco type work. What I'm going to do, we're going to make some little marble streaks and then we're going to pour like a stone sort of finish on top. And what I'm starting off here, I'm starting with part A, part B, part A, part B. I'm not sure which is which anymore. Um, but I have added black pigment to one of these and I'm going to just go ahead and dunk the other one in there. I've got about a minute worth of working time on them, so I'm just gonna mix them together a little bit, make sure that everything is combined pretty well. And since these are pretty, pretty um, graphic details, we're gonna put a pretty thick stripe of this marbling on here to start with. And I'm gonna start off the mold so I don't have a big weird pool right in the middle. And I'm gently gonna drizzle a couple little, oh, not quite like that. I'm gonna drizzle a little stripe across and then with that stripe, what I have is I'm gonna make a few little veins here coming off of it to give it more of a marble look through here. I wanna get rid of some of these little bubbles that I were little dots. Bring some of this up the side and make sure that I've got a cool effect. I can also, so it's not just one sort of little vein through there, go ahead and add a few other stripes kind of across the rest of this. All right, so we've let our initial little pour here, little veining set up for a couple minutes. Um, we don't want it completely set. We just need it so it doesn't move around. It's at a stiff gel state right now. There you go. Um, and now we're gonna pour in our kind of granite finish. We've got this sort of particle sand powder here. I'm gonna add it to one of my portions. Again, I'm not sure. Let's this is a switch. black and white quarry tone uh, available from, uh, from Smooth On. 
and, um, and what you do is mix uh, about as much as one of your components. So about equal parts of quarry tone. This one is black and white because of our black and white graphic art deco thing that we're doing. And, uh, and equal parts of the quarry tone and part A or B because those are equal. Uh, and then mix those together. Yeah, and then add the part A to the mixed. And then again, got about a minute to work with this here. So I'm gonna mix it through, make sure all the little particles haven't had the time to settle yet. They will settle out. One thing you can do is keep mixing it until it starts to thicken a tiny bit and then pour it. Or uh, if we didn't have this vanding in here, like you remember we did with the stone totems, you can actually mix it in the mold until it starts to gel and then it'll settle and basically suspend the, the stone particles all the way through. Um, because we're only seeing mostly the top of this, it kind of, it's okay if it settles. So, hey, that's a benefit. Um, so it's mostly mixed through here and then I'm just gonna gently kind of pour it over, let it fill up to the top, get some of the stuff that's at the bottom already kind of through here. So we get more of the textured look. It's probably just about out of frame, but we have our waste mold right here, our scrap mold. Uh, so whatever we don't use, we can pour into the scrap mold and get uh, sci-fi greeblies out of it. Chemical cure on this stuff is about 10 minutes. 30 minute demold means it's stiff enough because it, it, it will remain slightly pliable for a period of time while it's hot. So you kind of just give it time to cool off a bit and then, uh, and then we'll demold. But you'll, no, you'll never see that because uh, we're going uh, to kill the cameras now and then it'll happen almost immediately. Yep. All right, so we're going to demold, demold the thing now. Demold. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> I'm an accent. Okay. Um, and that just means taking our finished product out of the mold that we poured it into earlier. I don't know what it's going to look like. It might suck. Pull it out. It might not. Yeah. There it is. It's pretty nice. So yeah, that's it's beautiful. Really we're going to call that a success and uh, make a bunch more of them. Yeah, we're good. And uh, so that's a, with one mold, it'll, it'll take a little while, but, but yeah, there you go. So it's just a, just a graphic marbling that will kind of go with our Art Deco thing. Now, let me explain this. Part of the reason why we're doing that is that the Art Deco piece that we're doing is basically like a, a smooth lacquer finish, and it's very uh, industrial man-made. There's no organic component. And in most Art Deco pieces like that, what you would have is a mixture of industrial and organic. So let's say it's a piece of furniture and it's got lacquer, you might have an inlay strip or something like that. That would be bird's eye maple or something that is a bit more grounding so it doesn't just feel like a synthetic piece. So that's what we're doing. Behold all of its Arch Deco-y goodness. I'm not sure I said this before, but uh, when we got the calls with the Art Deco style, that was just kind of like inner squee because uh, Art Deco is, that was kind of the pinnacle of design. It's honestly, it's all been downhill since then. Um, actually, I was gonna say no offense, but seriously, offense to mid-century modern. Art Deco is where it's at. I hope we did it justice. Uh, this is the bottom of the carcass. Uh, that's the top. We have the doors here. Uh, this medallion, comet thing, will be right there. And that will attach to the bottom section, like a so. And then on the top, uh, Anna Vanna is gonna demonstrate uh, where that little thing goes. Up here we have the guts for all of our uh, RFID goodness, and this is, that's with these guys. That's gonna be a fairly straightforward RFID puzzle where you find the right object, put it on the right plinth, and uh, something will happen. Um, over here on the left side of the cabinet, we're gonna have something a little more complicated. Um, it's still technically using the RFID puzzle, but done in a way that you actually get a lot more permutations and a lot more variability and trickier to solve, uh, for which I'm having to learn Raspberry Pi quick, fast, in a hurry. So uh, I am jumping all over that grenade. And um, also, we're going to have to custom fab or at least modify some hinges. This whole thing is going into a fairly tight space, and uh, normal hinge is only going to give you 180 or maybe like 195 degrees of open. And we need to get a full 270 so that when the doors open, they're coming all the way around and then back to the sides. Uh, otherwise, there's just no room in there because uh, it's a tight space. So we'll see you on that one.